Hi, I'm Marco Alessi and I'm the director of Four Quartets. Welcome to the 33rd Teddy Award. I'm Hannah Congdon and I'm here with director Marco Alessi to discuss his short film, Four Quartets. Hi and welcome to the Bellinale. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, so I wanted to start by asking you just where the idea for the film came from. Was it based on personal experiences or talking to friends? For sure. Um, yeah, kind of meeting point of a few things. Um, I think the starting point for me was, um, it's my first narrative short, and I was thinking about what I wanted to explore as a filmmaker, um, kind of visually speaking. I'm quite interested in um, <clears throat> like form and uh, different ways of telling films. Uh, and so what immediately struck me was uh, the theme of kind of queer spaces and the kind of non-verbal language uh, that has <clears throat> organically evolved kind of over um, time in those spaces, namely, you know, how uh, queer people can communicate via cruising, um, using like, eye contact and uh, kind of subtle gestures and body language and things. So I wanted to see how um, I would do at kind of translating that into film um, and exploring a young person's experience of uh, queer space, maybe early in their kind of career of going out in that way. Um, and have as little dialogue as possible and kind of communicate a, um, a like strong emotional arc through just their experience of that non-verbal space. Mm. Um, and four quartets emerge from that. I'm trying to remember, is there a single word spoken? There is. Oh, there is. There is. Um, big debate about whether or not we should actually have it. Uh, there is a, a kind of, don't want to have any spoilers, but there's a moment towards the end and uh, it's a bit of a uh, lost in translation moment where someone kind of whispers in his ear and you kind of hear it. Um, mm. And uh, I think that was useful insofar that it kind of shows you how much that lands I mean, in the context of uh, somewhere where like, language isn't really used in that way. Mm. And so when someone finally does say something um, and it's not necessarily what you want to hear, um, it kind of has 10 times the, uh, the weight. Yeah. And the title of the film, Four Quartets, sort of refers to the, the splits of the four chapters on most of the film. Yeah. Why did you want to break it down into those four chapters and, and how do you almost characterise those four chapters? Sure. Um, four Quartets is uh, a name stolen from a poem, uh, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. And um, I, I kind of took inspiration from that poem and so far that it talks about time and space and how those things fold in on each other and um, I, the film, it, it was a big inspo for the film and so far that it all happens in this one club space and uh, it's continuous drama with like, these four cutaway moments. Um, if you took them out it would play continuously and so, and you see him arrive and you see the end when the lights turn on. So in that way the time of the night is kind of condensed down to ten minutes and so that, that idea was inspired by the way the poem kind of talks about how time falls in on itself and and uh, different moments impact on other moments in ways that are unexpected. Um, so then, kind of turning to the cutaway moments, they, for me, I wanted to explore how essentially flashback can be used um, slightly differently to uh, convention. Um, and so I was, there's a few moments to talk about, um, almost like little dramatic moments in the poem that talks about how um, different uh, 
moments of time can like play into like present moments or past moments in ways that are unexpected, as I said. And so I was looking at creating flashbacks that are almost like emotional rhymes to a moment, rather than explaining a specific detail of that story. So rather than you know like someone's uh, looking at an apple and they start crying, and then you cut back to like their mum eating an apple as she died, and that's just like straightforward. You know that explains that moment. I was trying to kind of see if there were these slightly strange removed moments that could uh, give you kind of an emotional context to that person and make you understand why in this club space ultimately it's just like a night out isn't you know the biggest deal in the world. I'm kind of playing into the melodrama a bit by giving you some emotional context that seems a bit unrelated so that when you cut back to the club and someone's rejected him in a specific way, you know exactly what's playing on his mind. Um, even though that's not narratively specifically related to that moment. Yeah. that makes sense? Yeah. Um, and the poem is all about that. And so I, it was kind of, I thought, the working title's going to stick. <laughs> it's one yeah. of those moments. <laughs> and with the, the sort of non-linear way of storytelling, were you trying to engage specifically with queer film techniques or was, were you influenced by any particular queer film? Um, yeah, there was a few, um, a bit weird, um, but Salo. <laughs> Um, Pasolini is a massive hero of mine and um, he talks a lot about free and direct discourse in film, the idea of like, trying to create a world in your film that's reflective of that person's experience of it, it in ways that are subtler than just like point of view or really loud signposting. Um, and so, yeah, um, exactly that. I mean, I condensed it down. This whole night plays out as a continuous 10 minutes and so far that that's kind of what that person's experience of the night is like. And so there's lots of stuff happening in terms of, um, you know, moments where we empty the club and just have flashing lights, um, and then suddenly it fills um, on, a, on a beat and things like that that are kind of just reflective of that particular character's experience of the space. Um, and that is drawn specifically from, like, certain queer filmmakers that I love. Um, and films that aren't necessarily about queer filmmakers, but um, I still think are queer. Um, Beau Travail. Uh, you know, that's got, it's, it's got its iconic final scene, <clears throat> and I think uh, I actually saw that film towards the end of the edit process of Four Quartets for the first time. It's one of those wild kind of, oh my gosh, moments. Like, <laughs> this is, we've done the same thing, and I'm so happy about that. Um, where, yeah, I mean, it chooses to land the film with the scene that's about someone's kind of emotional state and resolution rather than like a tidy little bow that's like, here's a narrative conclusion. I'm amazed at how many references you managed to fit in in a 10-minute ten, <laughs> film. Um, so you talked a little bit about the fact that there's, there's not much talking in the film, mm. and so much of the communication is through this very potent body language, which is also very intrinsic to club culture. How did you manage to pull that body language out of the actors? Um, I had the most amazing cast, um, and I owe a lot to them in that respect. Uh, Laurie Kiniston, who plays Raph Reed, um, it's just a magical actor, it's one of those people that does stuff and you watch back takes and there's just so much more happening than you could even have really been conscious of in the room, which is great. Um, and kind of all the satellite actors that revolve around him in the film uh, were also just wonderful. So I, the headline is, I just owe them a lot. They really kind of switched into that mode. Um, it was a weird rehearsal process. It's so much about, yeah, just two people in the space and needing to be in the space um, to really make sense and for the music to be playing and for the crowd to be there. So there were lots of kind of one-on-one -on -one meetings where I sat down and we spoke meticulously through um, what's happening to that character. Conventional rehearsals, but I think it, you know, it really required a lot of um, personal engagement from everyone and they shared a lot with me about kind of their experiences of nightlife. Um, a good example, in my opinion, of why you should web as much as possible for multiple reasons, like cast queer people in queer roles. That's actually what I was going to ask, like, is, almost, is are most of the characters gay yeah. or trans who are playing gay yeah, or trans literally characters? Yeah, literally everyone, yeah. yeah. Uh, all bar one, actually, um, is, uh, yeah, playing, is aligns with what their character is exactly in the film. And I think you can tell. I think it's one of those things which is like, that's, it's about, you know, micro expressions and stuff that people get or they don't get. Um, and you, I think you see it really, really clearly, not so much in focal text, but in talking more generally, in sex scenes. Um, 120 beats per minute has that like, incredible sex scenes. Um, and I think that very much speaks to the actors being able to in, engage the experience and understand what it feels like to be a queer male body that's being touched in that way and showing it authentically. And yeah, um, I owe a lot to my actors, I'm sure. <laughs> And why specifically did you want to set it in the space of a queer club? Why, why did you see that as the place where this narrative should take? Um, should take yeah, I think it's... 
this is where it kind of gets a bit more personally inflected. Um, I think aspects of it reflect the um, experiences I had. I grew up in Soho in London, pretty weird, an intense place to grow up. My parents worked in the area and it just kind of worked out that way. And um, uh, so when I was quite young, not underage, couldn't go to clubs and stuff, I was still walking around the area and kind of witnessing the back end of that nightlife, people leaving, people going in. And uh, I kind of built up a really big, like, big idea of what I expected queer nightlife to be, and it's yeah. gonna be this like, massive release. Um, and that moment came, and it's not that it's an anticlimax, but it's just you, you build the stakes so much. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna enter the space. It's gonna be super safe. I'm gonna find all my like, queer family. Um, I'm gonna sleep with loads of people. Everyone's gonna find me attractive. It's gonna be wonderful. And then you bowl up, and it's a bit like, um, how do I navigate this? Like, who do I speak to? Oh my God, I'm like five years old. This is like, I shouldn't be here. What's going on? Um, and so I wanted to play with that, what it's like for a young queer person to, um, to experience those spaces for the first time. And, you know, they kind of see it as a bit of a mecca and then how they navigate that and their expectations versus reality. Friendly Society, the club we um, filmed in, is also um, one that was my local. And, um, I kind of like that injection of the personal, being able to go to a space that I know really well and I know the people that own it and run it and they're wonderful. Um, and so being able to kind of have a little bit of space there that kind of speaks to my experiences in Soho. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and dancing and the music is such a big part of Raf, I think, coming, I don't know, coming to terms with his sexuality but expressing his sexuality. Um, and I wondered why, why that focus on dancing and <clears throat> musicality in the film? Yeah. Um, Again, this is, it's <clears throat> one of those instances where I was able to lean on resources. I had my first short film, you know, it's really difficult to get things off the ground and you need to kind of know what you have available to you. And my partner, Tom Foskett Barnes, is a composer and um, <clears throat> he composed the song with a very close friend of mine, Bobby Goulder. Um, and so they were able to write this amazing disco track um, that spans the entire film. Um, I knew an amazing choreographer, choreographer called James Berkeley, um, and he was able to come in and kind of work really early on with the track as it was being written and like figure out what that was gonna look like and be on set and coach the actors through that and make them really comfortable. So practically speaking, it was just, um, I, I knew I'd be able to pull that off um, and so I leaned into that a bit. Um, I just love, it's a bit, bit wanky, but I just love dancing as a metaphor. I think it's great, and it's used all the time in queer film. I reference Beau Terai. Um, it's no surprise that clubbing is such an like, integral experience, an aspect of queer experience and queer history, and um, I think for that reason, it's, it's a kind of, dancing is a thing that's just very easily married to kind of queer storytelling. Um, and it worked really well. For me, I, I found it worked really well um, for the film in giving something rough a bit more tangible to work through. So the kind of idea that I worked on with Laurie and James, choreographer, was this idea that um, as he kind of trapezes from person to person through the night, um, his dancing style changes or his dancing reflects his, his kind of closeness or um, distance to that person that he's finding himself with. Um, and in a short that has no speaking, kind of finding other little ways to create types of dialogue are really nice and useful and necessary, so um, yeah, he, when he's on his own, it's when he's at his freest and kind of um, most uh, kind of unafraid. Yeah, because it's lovely, that's what the film concludes on, is this image of him just dancing yeah. on his own. That right, happens. and there's a kind of small difference there in that he's the, the host, the drag host, um, Holly Styrene, um, I think she's changed her name now, but yeah, um, is present with him at that point, and it's mm. kind of, you have these two figures the club host who's kind of this island in the club that goes around and doesn't necessarily have a conventional night out because they're working. And Raph kind of get their moment and they dance as he danced at the beginning on his own, but now with all the lights on and someone else present. So there's a kind of nice little sense that, although he's still very much on a journey, there's a, a little bit of a graduation in his comfort with himself by the end, hopefully. Was that character, was the actor the actual host of? No, the they, they don't actually have, I think they've started to, but they didn't actually have drag queens there that oh, regularly. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I found really lovely about the film was you very rarely see, <coughs> you very rarely see friendships between uh, gay girls and gay boys, often in films. And there's a really lovely friendship between Raf and, I'm not sure, I don't yeah, know if her name's the names are okay, yeah. yeah. We've got her um, Alice randomly, but yeah. But yeah, I just wondered why you particularly wanted to show that, because actually it is quite a rare relationship shown on film. Yeah. Um, 
I think it's it's something I agree. I think it's the the, the rareness of it. I completely I completely agree. I think it's um, again it speaks of personal experience. Like I've leaned I lean quite heavily on those platonic kind of queer friendships, um, and uh, I I think there's an interesting double sidedness to that. Um, those people that you lean on in the club that are kind of slightly functional in some ways. You know, you need them until you don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, th I think that's a really interesting dynamic. Uh, something a bit unfair. Like, there's a couple of times when he just like, something shit happens and he just leaves her. He just walks to the bar at one point and just kind of leaves her dancing on her own and it's just not that fair. And so I kind of wanted to like nod to the selfishness as well that comes out whilst giving space for what I think is just a really, really wholesome and lovely thing to, to recognize, which is just um, how there are people like that that are your safe space. Um, so one of the cutaways is when they're dancing on their own to try and reflect what that is like for him um, and her emotionally. We kind of cut to them doing more or less the same thing in a bedroom, I guess roughly when they've come home from another night out, God knows when, and they're doing a similar dance like on the bed in jammies and he's still wearing his shirt for the night out and it's just a bit of a mess and they're just having a good time. And then you cut back to the club and it just gives you a nice sense of what that little bubble means for them. Yeah. Kind of turning back to my personal experiences, there are definitely those two friends um, that uh, I would kind of need uh, on those nights where you kind of you go out and you're really ready for a great time, and then it doesn't necessarily amount to what you're hoping it to be, and um, it's fine because yeah. you have your people. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to capture that on screen. Yeah. And so my final question was. Uh, Raph doesn't actually kiss anyone or really have any major physical contact with anyone uh, in the film. Why did you choose for that to be sort of the ending of the film? Um, I think I just wanted to slightly um, decenter it from shagging. <laughs> uh, basically, it's um, it, it it kind of is more about it ends up being more about how he feels in the space and what his relationship to the community is like. Um, for me, I kind of realized um, community is about being confident in yourself and knowing that that's going to be accepted, rather than kind of scoping what the community looks like in your opinion. And, and being verified by someone else. Being verified by someone else, seeking a specific type of validation. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, the script had versions where, you know, he kind of sees someone that he was eyeing earlier on leaving and they kind of give him a glance and he follows. Um, but I didn't want it to be like, yeah, they've gone off to sleep together now. It's the end conclusion. I wanted it to be a little bit more like, actually, no, wh where have we, where have we finished up? Like, well, um, it's still very much a journey for him. He's a young person figuring out kind of how he fits in that space and how he negotiates that space. Um, and I kind of I wanted it to end on a note of kind of self love and um, self care, I guess, rather than um, maybe a slightly more conventional specifically gay, not queer narrative of just, you know, it's about sex. Um, it is about sex, but it's about more than that. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking to My us. Absolute pleasure. And have a really nice rest of your time Thank at the Bellinale. See you around. Yeah, definitely. <laughs>